Assalamualaikum and a very good morning to those in Malaysia and good afternoon to Professor Linye, who is currently in Australia. Wherever you are at the moment, welcome to Distinguished Lecture Series organized by University Technology Malaysia UTM. I'm Habib Ghazali, a senior lecturer in the School of Mechanical Engineering here in UTM, and I will be your moderator for today's lecture. I am very glad to introduce our distinguished lecturer today, Professor Linye, the Director of the Centre of Advanced Materials Technology at the University of Sydney, Australia. Professor Ye was my PhD supervisor at the University of Sydney, and I would describe him as a very wise supervisor, and it was a privilege to be his student. Most PhD holder that I have met describe their PhD journey as a very stressful one. But all I can say that mine was the best time of my life. Even after I have graduated, I still seek his advice sometimes. So thank you, Prof. Ye, for that. And thank you for accepting our invitation today. Today, Professor Ye will be talking about the issue and challenges in 3D printing of continuous fiber composite. But before that, I would like to invite the Dean of Engineering Faculty of UTM, Professor Rafik, to briefly introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Habibah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Hello, welcome everyone. Welcome to our 85th UTM Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series. My name is Muhammad Rafik, and I am the Dean of Engineering University Technology Malaysia. Today, it is my utmost pleasure to welcome Professor Lin Ye from the University of Sydney Australia. A bit about our distinguished speaker today, Lin Ye currently is a full professor at the School of Aerospace, Mechanical and Mechatronic Engineering and the director of the Center for Advanced Materials Technology of the University of Sydney. He received his B.Eng. degree from Harbin Uni Engineering University in 1982, M.Eng. in 1984, and PhD in 1987 from Beijing University of Aeronautics and Astronautics. He then joined the Xian Jiao Tong University as a lecturer in early 1988. He joined the University of Sydney in July 1992 after working as an Alexander von Humboldt Fellow at the Institute for Composite Materials from 1990 to 1992. His major research interests are in the areas of composite science and technology, smart materials and structures, nanomaterials and nanocomposites, structural integrity and durability. He was elected a fellow of the Australian Academy of Engineering and Technology in 2005. So that is a brief biography and uh, for our, of our distinguished speaker. Here now is Professor Lin Ye from the University of Sydney, Australia, with a talk entitled 3D printing of continuous fiber composites, issues and challenges. Professor Lin Ye, over to you. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So it's my great pleasure uh, to receive the invitation from Professor Rafik and uh, Dr. Habiba to give a lecture. I think. Uh, uh, in particular, nowadays in this kind of environment, the COVID-19, this is a good opportunity to share some kind of personal view to a, a broader uh, audience uh, about the research in a particular area. So now I just share my screen so I can uh, start. Okay, so Professor Rafik already mentioned the, the title of my talk today. It's really relevant to an area nowadays we call it a hot topic. It's relevant to the additive manufacturing. But before doing that, uh, I'd like to introduce a little bit about Australia and also university in Australia, uh, universities in Australia and uh, also about the universities of uh, Sydney. So some background information, maybe, it, maybe 
those information is more uh, uh, interesting to a broader audience. Okay, so first I think uh, about uh, Australia. It's a big land, uh, uh, so the population is about uh, uh, 25 million. I don't know how big the Malaysia, but I, in my gut feeling is correct, it's probably about a million, but just less than a million. So we have about uh, seven states, uh, one, uh, we say, uh, uh, six states, one uh, capital territory. So the Australia is uh, uh, basically, most of the population is on the east coast. So we have uh, Sydney at uh, this location, then Melbourne at uh, here, then I think Queensland just at this uh, uh, border between the you know uh, between the New South Wales and the Queensland. Then we have a Perth at uh, Western Australia. Then here is really the Adelaide. So that's a, the, just a big city, just like Kuala Lumpur. Okay. So then there is a very beautiful landscape around Australia. So I think this place, I think uh, east of the ocean. Uh, of Queensland is a great barrier reef. So the snorkeling to see the beautiful reef is a, a one major attraction for the tourist. Then I think uh, Sydney, we all know this a beautiful landmark. It's, uh, uh, we say this is a, a Sydney Opera House and also the Harbour Bridge. Then uh, near the, the Melbourne, we have a great ocean road. This is uh, 12 postals. Then in Western uh, in the middle, there's a big rock. Okay, there's uh, some, sometimes people claim this is the largest uh, single rock uh, on planet. Okay. Then we say, if going to the West, I think uh, 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 we have a Western Australia. I think the total population of the Western Australia probably just about two million or two and a half. I'm not sure exactly number. But uh, they, they have the almost one third of land of the Australia. So if you will have a, if you're visiting our, uh, Western Australia, uh, you probably have a much more chance to meet kangaroo or, or other animal than human. Okay. So basically, if you drive on the road, you probably only meet one car per day, something that in that kind of scale. Then we say in terms of the university. There are about uh, 40 universities in Australia. Uh, I think they are basically all uh, two, I think 38 are federal funded universities. Then there are two private universities. I'm not sure exactly about these two, but I think in, in general, real university are really federal government uh, uh, supported by the federal government. But I have to say now that in terms of my understanding about the university budget, I think it's only about 30%, okay, in terms of federal budget. And then there's some other like uh, fee from the local and uh, uh, international student. Then there is a top eight university. Uh, I think uh, uh, we sometimes call it GO8, or group of eight. So basically they are the top university in Australia. So if you look at any league table around the world, those eight universities basically are ranked within 150, okay, of top, world top university in any kind of league table. So, for example, there is the Australian National University, it's, it's uh, in the Canberra, it's uh, in the uh, 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 capital territory. Melbourne University in Melbourne, Sydney University in Sydney, Queensland University in Brisbane. Then we have a uh, university in New South Wales, which is not far away from Sydney. Then we have a Monash University, which is in the Melbourne. Then we have a University in Western Australia, that's in, the, in Perth, okay. Then we have an Adelaide University, which is in the South Australia. Why we call GO8 is really, they take about 70 to 75% of the like government supported uh, research program. One is what we call ARC, that is the Australian Research Council. Then another one is an NHMRC, I think this is called National Health Medical Research Center uh, Council. So you can see that uh, top eight universities take a majority of the research funding, 
then the other university basically take the rest. So after the top university, there is a group of university, university we sometimes call technology university, including the Newcastle University, which is about 100 kilometers north of Sydney. Wollongong University is about, uh, I think, uh, 80 kilometers south of Sydney. Macquarie University is more focused on, the, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, not science technology, focus on the, like uh, human, uh, we call, uh, how to say, sometimes I forgot the, the focus on like uh, 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 social science or the like economy. That's a uh, Macquarie University also in Sydney. Then Queensland University in Technology in Brisbane, Melbourne, Royal Melbourne University of Technology, that's in Melbourne. It's a focus on mainly on, it's oriented uh, background in really the aerospace technology. Then we have University Technology of Sydney, and then you have a uh, Flinder University that's in Adelaide, Griffiths University that I think is uh, also in Brisbane, James Cook, I think that is in Townsville, it's really north of the Queensland. So in terms of the University, University of Sydney, sometimes we call uh, it is the really oldest uh, uh, university in the Southern Hemisphere. So it's, a, uh, I think uh, we celebrate his 165, 170 uh, years birthday recently. So uh, if you look at the landmark, the upper house is here. This is the Harbor Bridge. This, in fact, we call CBD, just uh, like uh, this Twin Tower area in, in Kuala Lumpur, in the, really in the city center. So Sydney Uni was, when Sydney Uni was uh, established 170 years ago, it's uh, really the, we saw the, uh, in the far end, it's a suburban uh, area, it's not really the city center, but now because after 170 years, uh, Sydney Uni is really close to, see, to the city center, basically in the, within the walking distance. That sounds like uh, 30 or 40 minutes walk. On Sydney Uni, you can walk to the upper house in one, one, I think more than one hour, just over one hour. Then here is really the main quadrangle of the University of Sydney. So if you look at the building, you get the impression this looks like a Cambridge or the Oxford. So that's basically the style of the building inherited from the, uh, from the British uh, when, the, the, when the, they had a colonial here. So sometimes you will look at the university, uh, like Sydney Uni also ranked among the top 10 most beautiful campus, um, university with the most beautiful campus, just because of all the old like sandstone building. Yeah. When I talk about, when I mentioned the GOA, that group of eight, sometimes we also call it sandstone university. That's basically, you will see that go to the campus, you should, you should be able to see some kind of the building which is a build, uh, uh, which was built 100 years ago. Then the other university, like technology university, that's probably built about 50 years ago. People widely start to use the concrete or other kind of the construction material. But, we, but having said that, I have to say engineering. Engineering is here. I think uh, Dr. Habiba spent some time here. That's really a concrete building. Yeah, that uh, building was uh, built, I think, in about 50 years ago, okay. So that's the, 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 the overview of the university. Just have a look at uh, what is the University of Sydney. So we have, we sometimes call it a comprehensive university. So we have a 10 campus, but uh, I think the uh, largest one is the one I just showed. The rest of the campus is really put together probably only about less than half of the main campus. So we have uh, over 60,000 uh, enrollment. So if you translate to the full-time student, you're probably talking about 50,000. Then there is about 30% uh, of the postgraduate student, but this uh, postgraduate including two categories. One is really, uh, I think, uh, coursework masters. So like uh, uh, in the commerce, in science, uh, even engineering, yeah. It's basically like a, a, a higher education, like after a basic degree. Then we say 
out of the thirty percent, it's probably only about five uh, percent uh, out of thirty percent are really the research student. So that means uh, who are doing a, a higher degree in research, like uh, Dr. Habiba, he got, uh, she got his uh, PhD uh, in Sydney. Yeah, that's his uh, research degree. Now we have about uh, nearly twenty uh, twenty thousand, or we say hundred hundred thousand. Uh, what? 18,000 uh, interna international students. I think out of this uh, 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 18,000 uh, international student, majority are from Asia. I think uh, that's the, uh, I think probably uh, once uh, 15,000 are really from China. That's just uh, before the pandemic, okay. Now we you know, also have 16, uh, 17 faculty, that is about 100, 200 school department institute center. The total operation budget of Sydney Uni is about 2.6 billion. I think that's probably two years ago. I'm not sure last year's number. Out of this, uh, uh, the 2.6 billion, about 300 million, I really use as uh, research funding uh, from the diff, uh, 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 obtained from the different source, from like uh, as I, uh, I mentioned, the government research council like ARC or the NHMRC. Then we have a uh, like a uh, very active student club uh, like a uh, rolling, uh, or or the swimming or like uh, 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 cycling, whatever. There's a lot of uh, club and uh, society uh, for the uh, very in trade uh, enriched the student uh, life on campus or the for the good uh, experience. So here is a really a list you can see uh, about the university faculty. I think uh, we have a uh, like start from the agriculture relevant to food and arts, architecture, dentistry, economics, education, engineering. Then we have a health, law, medicine, nursing, pharmacy, science, uh, uh, college arts, then the conservatory, city like conservatory or music and also veteran science. You can see the really cover almost everything in the society. Uh, in terms of engineering, one thing I can say in Sydney, engineering is not really a big faculty. We are only about 10% of the whole university. So I think uh, sometimes we are really jealous about a large factory like the science or the, or, or the health science. They have a weight, maybe 20% of the university each. So you, they have a much more say in terms of university uh, strategic planning or the uh, or other type of the activity. Okay, so back to the uh, uh, the Center for Advanced Materials Technology. I think this is really a center inside the university. The center was established in 1989. Okay, uh, so we had a 30 years uh, anniversary workshop uh, last year. We have a a uh, total number of the alumni about uh, three thousand, uh, three hundred. So, so we have a really many of them are really now are really a leader in the, their own area around the world. I, I think in particular in the Asian area like China, Hong Kong, or, or uh, your uh, like uh, uh, now including Malaysia, yeah, and also in Australia. So currently we have uh, something like. Uh, 20 research staff, visiting scholar, and 30 postgraduate research students. We publish about 70 papers per annual, then journal, and also present about 30 papers in the international conference. But that is not for this year, it's for last year, yeah. So now we have about 10 competitively funded projects. Uh, in the center here is really the, some personnel. I think uh, Professor Yuan Mai is the inaugural director for the center. Uh, then myself, we have a uh, Professor Xiao Zhou Liao, Professor Qing Li, Professor Andrew Rice, who departed last year. So that basically gives an idea is really like a, a, some kind of the center, not very big, but uh, very efficient. We, 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 have a, we share the lab, we, we support each other in the big, uh, we form as a critical mass uh, for bidding the larger project. Okay, back to this uh, project. Okay, that's a project. Uh, I think 3D printing is something. Uh, sometimes people say new. Sometimes they say oh, it's not new. It's a rapid prototyping idea, 
But anyway, this has been become a hot topic. Okay, so a lot of people working in this area. So we basically have the uh, myself basically have the background in the fiber reinforced composite. So we have been seeing okay what uh, we can achieve using the, this uh, new technology. So now they, I think in terms of scientific research, sometimes we also get a feeling yeah uh, we we studying the myth rather than the fact. Why I'm saying so is that basically everyone is just doing it, okay? Seems no one really asks a question why we are doing it, okay? That seems uh, it's a, a problem translate from mouse to mouse, then eventually we lost the, 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 the basic uh, question. So sometimes I, I have a colleague from Imperial College, he's really a senior professor. Sometimes we have a discussion uh, in, 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 in the forum, and he always uh, and uh, when I say something, are we doing this, someone doing this, then he, sometimes he likes to say a sentence, say, you always do it in this way, doesn't mean it's correct. Okay, that's basically what I'm trying to hint is that what I'm present doesn't mean it's correct. Okay, it's just a, 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 some kind of thing to share with you to see what we think. Doesn't mean it's correct. Okay. Okay. So basically, I like to talk about uh, this uh, uh, 3D additive manufacturing relevant to polymer and the polymer composite. Talk about some issue uh, inside. Then I move on to some kind of method to characterize this kind of the problem. Then we see what the direction we can move on. Okay. okay so 3D printing. I think sometimes uh, we call uh, 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 additive manufacturing. So there is a why that basically nowadays a lot of people use is really powder base. You 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 with the, you start with the powder, then you have a, a a laser source then to fuse them. Then this powder can be metal, can be polymer, even ceramics. Okay, but then you need a very delicate uh, instrument. Another technology is to start with the filament. Okay, so this uh, is really we call. Filament deposition modeling. This terminology uh, is invented by statistics, but has been widely used. So basically, you, you just deposit like you drop a noodle on the surface of the previously deposited material. Then, because uh, this is a molten material, it will uh, fuse with the previously deposited material. So this technique can be, in fact, if you have a uh, mainly used for the polymer. But if you have uh, some kind of additional heat, you can apply the technology to, to the metal, but basically like a welding technology, yeah, basically. So FDM is, uh, has been, most of the like uh, printer, or, like 3D printer uh, on market, that's cheaper brand, are all based on the uh, uh, FDM. Uh, for basically use uh, some kind of filament from polymer, then we say another te uh, technology uh, terminology people frequently use is the, we call the fused filament fabrication. It's FF. So FDM, FF is the same thing. So basically, I'm talking the thing is relevant to these uh, ideas. Anyway, so this is really, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, microstructure of the uh, uh, 3D printed uh, material through this. Uh, uh, FDM process. So if you look outside, okay, it's not very smooth, like uh, mirror-like. But if you look the inside, as so you can see, there is an issue of the because they, uh, of the poor bonding or the poor fusion. Okay, you can see there's a void between the filament. Uh, even between the filament, is not perfect. Okay, so you may end up the voids. So then we say the same material. If you really Put into a mold, just like uh, compression molding, you will have a fracture surface like fracture surface like this. So you can see there are no voids. Okay, voids is really become some kind of the key player that uh, cause uh, pre-mature failure for the three D printed um, structure of the component from the on the we call the uh, FDM or the FF uh, method. Okay, so. So the void can exist everywhere almost. It can exist between the filament, between the layer, because the material are built up, uh, start from the bottom layer, then build up layer by layer. So it can between the layer, 
Then you have a fiber composite voice can exist inside the, 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 the fiber tunnel. Then all the uh, large or small, then also you may have like, the, you already have the feed uh, void in the feed stock. That means there's some kind of uh, uh, fil uh, filament uh, pre-manufactured or formed by in-house technology. Then you may also have voids formed during the uh, depo uh, deposition. So in terms of the manufacturing technique, you may have a printing temperature, printing height, printing speed, the environment temperature, or the like a pressure from the printing nozzle, or have the influence. That's a big uh, parameter. A lot of a lot of uh, many many parameter. So sometimes we say because it's a fusion issues, then we say the best way is really we increase the temperature. Okay, that that is a common. Uh, method people may think about, but sometimes you increase the, the the temperature. For example, this is probably for the PRA. You can see the 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 void uh, getting smaller, but but it's still there. Okay, so then we say, okay, so then what is the, really the impact? So then we say, okay, this is the material. We say it's just a bulky material. We just do a little bit of quantitative, uh, trying to get a more a quantitative uh, information. Then we say here, really, we say that uh, it's, uh, I think it's ABS, uh, the polymer. It's uh, one is really 3D printed directly, another is the compression molding. So, no, we, it's a 3D printed, then compression molding. Then just see, okay, what is really the, 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 the biggest the impact? So, here you just say we did uh, some kind of DSC first. So, basically, you see there is no clear change in the glass condition temperature. Basically, it means, okay, uh, uh, the compression molding after after the the the, the uh, printing doesn't really have a big uh, negative impact. Okay, so then we just see okay what we can see in terms of material property. So we did like a, like a flexural and tensile test. So you can see material basically group into two group. Okay, categorized into the two group. One group is that you can clearly see they are really directly from the 3D printed specimen. So this is the, we say after 3D printed, then the, with the further compression molding. This is a tensile, this is a flexural. You can see there's a big difference, okay? So both in terms of the, we say, ultimate tensile strength, also the Young's model. So you can see the voice uh, has a big impact. So that's the compression molding really sub substantially reduce the void content inside the material. So here I give the idea what it look like. So this is the we say ABS with a directly printed comp uh, component of the material. What is the strength look like? Then this is the same material 3D printed, but with the further compression molding. You can see there's a clear increase okay, in the mechanical property in terms of modulus in terms of the uh, uh, tensile strength or the fact or the fracture uh, fracture modulus or the fracture strength. So then you can see this is a really we say the void has a really big play in the material property. So then we say how to address this sort of thing. Okay, if you look at the microstructure, you can see there's a clear difference. Of course, those kind of tiny defects are going to form the uh, we say the uh, 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 a small uh, stress concentration riser. So eventually it causes material premature uh, pre failure. Then we just say, okay, how do we understand this? So idea is really we say, okay, this kind of material are really made from the individual filament. So we are thinking to really to create a method to observe the peeling between the two filament after the we say the fusion. So let's see, okay, how how bad, how good it is. So then because the, the thin film. Normally, you don't have a chance to, 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 to use a bulky specimen. So because it's between the filament, it's just a single filament laid together. So then we use a technology we call essential work of fracture. Uh, I will articulate a bit more about this uh, method uh, uh, in a few minutes. OK, so how do we create the specimen? So basically, we use a MacBook 2 printer uh, from the market. It's a, a, a little bit of top end of the uh, basic printer. So we print material value that we call the implant. It really build the material a layer, okay, just a single layer. The thickness is about 100 micron. Another thing is we, we build a box, okay, really 
build a box, then we print a single layer of film. Okay, we can cut it from the specimen. So we say the thickness a little bit thicker, about 400 micron. So another one is really uh, compression molding. Okay, so in this case, uh, it's a 3D printed. Then we cut for the compression mold. You can see the material becomes smooth. Okay, so that's basically a three different type of film. So then we check the material with the with, uh, with the different manufacturing process. You can see one is based on the DSC, another on the based on the FTIR. You can see the the three piece of material uh, from the different the material from the three different process basically are identical in terms of the level of the crystallization or level of the like a uh, uh, bond between the we say the uh, molecular chain. Okay, so what is the uh, essential work of fracture? Is really trying to understand between like uh, creating a new surface, the in trying to crackify the energy needed to create a new surface. So normally it's applying to a thin film. Okay, so in this case, you have a when you load it, you can see okay if the thin film you may have a large scale yielding, but eventually the material will separate at this uh, uh, ligament here. So if you will load the specimen, you can really load, the, you start to load the specimen, you see the load increase, then they see the crack start to propagate eventually until uh, we say that the largest displacement, specimen, two specimens separated. Then you get a total error. Those errors also including the energy for the plastic deformation. Okay, this is the total energy dissipation including the plasticity, also the energy needed to create a surface. So this is really we call a, a technique uh, just developed for the thin film. I think uh, uh, I mentioned that Professor Gordon William from Imperial College, he is really a good fan. Ha, ha, ha. He has a good fan in the area, so we learn from him, so we, we use this technique. So, so basically, you, you get all the total fracture energy in terms of for the specimen of the different ligament lengths, okay, from the very short to long thick ligament, of course the total energy dissipated energy to break the specimen getting larger for the largest ligament. But then we just say, okay, when you have a in principle, when you have a zero ligament length, okay, then you get the energy to really to create a new surface for the that's what we call the. Uh, elastic part of energy used to fracture specimen. So this is what we call uh, a specific uh, essential work of fracture. So if we follow this this uh, uh, technique, we get a specimen, we use a razor blade to, to cut it, then we just test them, okay? The razor blade can really generate a very sharp specimen. It's a double edge notch, double edge notch tension specimen. Then we can load them. So this will give you an idea of what it look like was the different ligaments length from two millimeter to ten millimeter. So you can see they show very nice uh, similarity. Okay, so the basically indicate the fracture process is similar. So you can see this is a, I think this is probably about a, 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 I think this is ten millimeter uh, ligament length. So you can see the, the, what is actual fracture surface. So this is the really for the interlayer, it's the in-plane. Interlay, I think I just go back a little bit. So interlayer is really, it's a building on the uh, 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 thickness direction, okay. So you can see the, the similarity is not as good as the in-plane uh, uh, specimen, but uh, we still can see this kind of typical uh, thin film fracture. Then this is the compression molding, or you can see the, the similarity is much nicer, okay, for the different ligament lengths. Then we follow the process to figure out what is really the, the we say, the, 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 the specific essential work of fracture for the in-plane, interlayer, and the compression molded specimen. You can see, okay, first thing is really you can see the similarity or the consistency is very good for the compression molded or the in-plane. But uh, it's very bad for the interlayer. So if you're really trying to figure out, uh, if we're really trying to figure out what is the interception interception point here, which is we call a specific uh, essential work of fracture, then you can see, okay, this is really the actual value. 
So the in-play is about 25.7, then interlayer is about 21. Then we say the, the film after compression molding, that's basically the defect free film is about 38. So basically it means there is a defect. Okay, you may say, where does the defect come from? So even though we don't see there is a void there, but uh, the, there is no perfect uh, molecular diff interdiffusion. All this can, the way say that uh, when you're trying to fuse the particle, either the particle or the filament together, you have to allow the material between the two parts to interdiffuse across the interface. That takes time, okay? So here is really indicate why is it really imperfect uh, interdiffusion or the or well, maybe there is some uh, this tiny defect that uh, we haven't been able to see using normal microscopy, but uh, using larger amplification probably yes. But it, at least you can see is this manufacturing technology already differentiate the the quality for the in-plane fusion and the in the thickness. Uh, 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 and the interlayer fusion, okay? This technique already has differentiated the, the, the quality. So then we just say, okay, let's so say we move on to continuous fiber. Okay, oh, no, sorry, this short fiber. Let's say really, uh, uh, without from the pure polymer, the next step is with, with, with the, with the, with the uh, uh, short fiber. Short fiber, they have a length about uh, like a few hundred micro, uh, like from the, uh, sorry, a few like, uh, 30, 40 uh, micron to maybe about 200, 300 micron in length. It's carbon fiber, okay? So this is really the, the uh, we, we print, follow the same technique, we print a thin film, okay? Then we characterize uh, what is the in interface, okay? Uh, so, sorry, we, we, we cut a specimen, use a razor blade, this gives give you an idea what it look like in cutting the surface. Then we say we follow the same similar way to a similar way to check the using the DSC to check the melting point. They are basically three materials very similar. So we follow the same technique, a similar process, one the in-plane one layer uh, through the 3D printing. Then this is the interlayer in the thickness uh, direction. So this one is really uh, uh, we say the 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 uh, printed specimen. With further with the compression molding, okay. Further with the compression molding. Now let's just have a look with the fiber. Okay. Once you have a fiber, this is in plane. Basically, it's a printing direction. Uh, horizontally, you can see there is fiber orientation. Okay, there is fiber orientation in plane and then the out plane. Out plane probably you have more uh, a narrow than the distribution in terms of the uh, uh, orientation. And more focus on the zero degree. Then the in-plane, they spread out a little bit. Then after compression molding, basically because you have, you have enough at, at, at time there, so basically fiber almost randomly distributed, just like a normal short fiber in first polymer. Then we say we follow the same technique to characterize the, 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 the in, uh, essential work of fracture. This is for the different uh, ligament lengths. Uh, There's the in-plane. Then this is the uh, interlayer. Then you can see similar thing. This is a similar uh, stress uh, load displacement curve. This one you can see there's overlap already in the curve. So it means that there is some kind of effect from the defect inside the material. This is the three uh, uh, after compression molding. You can see the quality is, uh, is better. So if you will follow the same uh, uh, data regression technique, we can really calculate, estimate what is the essential work of fracture. Uh, uh, inside this kind of short fiber composite. So you can see uh, this is the really, we say the in plane is about 29. Then the in plane, uh, in thickness uh, direction is really about, in the layer is about 19.6. Then there is a, I think, uh, with a, a comp like a printed uh, with compression molding, you can see that the, the, the specific uh, uh, essential work of fracture is, uh, is a higher, a little bit higher, but it's lower than the in-plane, okay? Then this is a really the, we say pure polymer, it's a pure nylon, I mentioned before, about 38. You can see adding the composite, not really improve the fracture toughness, okay? 
that's basically the, the interface is poor after the characterization. We see some kind of adhesion is not great. But then this is the single layer uh, of the material. So, but in any case, you can see this uh, printing technique already differentiated the material fusion quality for the in-plane and the interlayer. So then we say next step is, uh, oh, yeah, this is the, what I mentioned in really you look at the microstructure for the, for the, for the, for the uh, uh, fracture surface. You can see uh, the interface is relatively, relatively poor. So eventually the thin short fiber reinforced uh, nylon it's a fracture toughness uh, is uh, even not as high as the uh, pure nylon. So we move further. Let's so say we say now we have a continuous fiber composite. That's probably uh, what I like to, to, to see. Yeah? Because I always think uh, you want to make something stronger, you need a continuous fiber composite. But here you can see uh, it's a single layer in-plane printed material. You can see it already have a defect. Clear defect here, so this won't be able to do any kind of meaningful characterization. Uh, even though we tried, you can see it uh, doesn't mean very much. You have a much scatter, larger scatter in terms of the fracture energy. Some that already approach zero, some then larger. It's in terms of ligament length. So we move to a better technique, so really to make a bulky specimen. So then we use the same uh, printer. So. So we find a method to get rid of the casing. That means that because uh, when you buy this kind of printer, it's, a pre, it's already have a preset program. Won't print the material you want. You have to engineer it a little bit. So then you use a, a technique to print uh, just a fiber reinforced composite. So the feed material now is really ha already have a pre-impregnated fiber. You can see the individual carbon fiber here. So this is a cross section. This is a long uh, uh, fiber filament direction. So this indicates really the uh, roughly diameter of the filament. The volume fraction inside the filament about 35%. So this is really actually printed composite. You can see it has a lot of voids, okay? So if you look at the, so this, uh, to quantify the void content, we did the SEM. You can check the, the black area is about 12%. Okay, also you can do this kind of micro CT uh, scanning, then it's a moving along the cross section, you can see there's a void inside the material, yeah, everywhere. So not terribly happy. So, but we did some kind of tests. Let's see, okay, tensile bending interlaminar fracture, then we just see, okay, what kind of properties it can generate. So here, give an idea, look like, okay, so this is the strength. Uh, this is the modulus, uh, this is the fractal strength, okay. If you just look at a number, they are looks uh, pretty good, okay? 60, is, you may say, oh, 60, not bad. I think aluminum is about 70, magnesium is about uh, 35, uh, so it's uh, stronger than uh, magnesium. But uh, they are not really the, the, the potential, the property predicted by the theory of like the rules of mixture. I will come to the point. So we have a lot of void inside. Then also we did the interlaminar fracture is really between the layer. We split them, okay, between the layer. So the fracturing, the cracking energy is really, really low. Even we have a fiber bridging give you a higher value for the propagation. If you look at the microstructure inside, then you have a lot of voids, okay. So what do we do? Follow the same idea, but that's okay. Then this material is really the material issue or the manufacturing issue. So we, 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 what we did is really we, we hot press it again, okay? Trying to reduce the weight content, okay? So then here is really to show what it look like. So this is the, on the, you have two color in each diagram. This is zero degree tension, 90 degree tension, fracture and the G1C. So you can see the left is really, uh, on the right is really with the compression molding. On the left is without compression molding. Green one is the strength, and blue one is the modulus. You can see after compression molding, all the properties increase, including the crack initiation property for the, we call the G1C, so I think the crack resistance between the layer, crack growth resistance between the layer. For the propagation, because uh, we say the bridging, you have a void, always normally promote a fiber bridging. So eventually, poor quality may get a higher uh, we say the interlaminar fracture resistance, 
with the bridging compared to the good quality. Okay, that's uh, some kind of phenomenon we observed a long time ago with a different type, all the different type of material. So look, put everything in the table, we can see with the after 3D, uh, after compression molding, all the property are improved. So I think uh, there is a, basically we understand there is a substantial negative impact on what. So if you look at the surface, it's also it's between the uh, directly printed and the printed uh, with the compression molding. You can see compression molding really remove a lot of void. Then that's the, the we say this is a, a fracture surface on the 90 degree tensile. That means that uh, uh, the load is perpendicular to the fiber. Uh, lay a printing direction with the perpendicular the printing direction with fiber. So this is the tensile fracture. So you can see. So this is after compression molding. This is the, like uh, this is parallel to the load. Okay, this is the vertical to the uh, load. Then so you can see the the void is substantially reduced. Okay, so this is also it's a fractal specimen. So you can see there's a lot of bridging, a lot of pull out compared to those that with the better consolidation or the removing the void by the compression molding. So here is really we say that we say you can see this is the uh, uh, we call the crack growth resistance curve for the, the one in the, for the directly printed, another with compression molding. In fact, I already discussed the results. So look at the fracture surface. You can see the voids they exist everywhere, but after compression molding, it's back to the normal fiber reinforced composite. Okay. So if you look at the voids, so you, you say that after compression molding, the void content has been substantially reduced. Okay. So basically, the thickness is reduced by 15%, then the void content is dropped from 10 to, we say, about uh, 3%. Okay. So that's basically hinted that reduced void content really increase uh, the, the, the property. So then we put the, the, the results uh, into the, the, we call the rule of the mixture. Okay. So here is the, basically the current uh, technique, uh, uh, whatever produced. Okay. So this dotted line here, is the rule of the mixture. Basically means, okay, you have a percentage uh, contribution from the fiber, percentage uh, contribution from the matrix. They follow the rule of the mixture. It's a simple engineering rule to predict the property. So you can see those are a lot of study, a lot of published data. People tell, always say, oh, that's a very good material, but they are very far away from the rule of the mixture, okay? So basically, rule of the mixture is the baseline. So even the composite produced uh, by whatever manufacturing technique doesn't really have a property uh, drop near to this line, means this is really very bad material, okay? So you can see there's a lot of published data in all the different areas. So here basically indicate, okay, there is some good bit here, but with high, high fiber volume fraction here was what we did here is really, you just say, okay, we need that technology. Just mean either compression molding or the other type of technique to really improve the reduce the void. So eventually you can lift the, the property of the material. So that's the tensile strength modulus. This is a fracture modulus and the fracture strength, a similar observation we see. So the, the, there's a long way for the 3D printing to print uh, quality material that can be used in the, I say the to use engineering structure. So, so this is uh, sometimes uh, my, my colleague uh, is uh, really, uh, he's working in the uh, biometal area. He think, okay, so I think this is basically a storage process. It's really uh, some kind of, from the beginning, the material is not good enough. A lot of por porosity inside, okay? So in conclusion, so we say in, in current, we say the 3D metal, 3D additive manufacturing, the fusion between the filament or the, between the powder, uh, in the, uh, we say the, in the 3D print polymer or the polymer composite, is not reaching its uh, full potential. It basically, for the argument here is for the FDM. But uh, you will say if the powder based, then you uh, like uh, using powder with the laser, like uh, LCR, uh, select laser melting, select laser sintering. But in that case, you can't put fiber inside. You can only use the uh, polymer powder. 
So with uh, fiber, you have to use uh, like FDN or the FFF, FFF in this case. So, but uh, it can't uh, build bonding between them doesn't reach the full potential. So we say the void in the composite uh, uh, has a very big negative impact okay, on the mechanical property. So we say the mechanical performance of the any kind of 3D printed or additive manufactured composite material Currently, we say a far away, far lower, okay, from those that are predicted by the rule mixture. So basically, the, we say the basic law of the composite uh, in design. So that means uh, we're still not yet close to the, we say, the good quality 3D uh, manufactured composite, composite. It's still a long way to go. I think uh, that's conclude my presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your attention. I'm just trying to stop my presentation. Okay. Uh, stop screen. Okay. I'm back to the screen. All right. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you very much for the interesting, very interesting lecture, Prof. Um, you make me feel like doing my second PhD. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But anyway, I really, fact, really enjoy it. Yeah, I think, in fact, this uh, the what I present here is really for another PhD student. And he just finished mm -hmm. recently. I present a uh, song. All right. Yeah. Um, I have one question from Professor um, Muhammad Nasir Tamin. Um, uh -huh. He's a professor in uh, UTM as well. So his questions for Professor Linier. Since there are many parameters involved in the fabrication in 3D printing and uh, compression molding, could we proceed by developing material models to capture the development of the void during the fabrication? Those um, could effectively establish the optimized set of processing parameters for the acceptable printed, printed composite. So he asked, what is your way forward? Okay, I think that's a very good question. I think, in fact, uh, we have a similar idea in that kind of direction. There are too many parameters. At the moment, there is very little control from what I understand. In terms, even though we can set uh, a printing speed or maybe a temperature, but uh, it's the uh, other like the compression force, like a rolling force for dropping. Uh, there is very little information. Also, we say, what is really minimum the required time for fusion bonding for the intermolecular chain diffusion? A lot of information not is not there. So I think this is uh, something probably uh, a task for the community research community, really trying to try to understand more, just not uh, just uh, understand the mechanism behind try trying to model it. For example, what is the temperature distribution? Okay. What is really the melting pool of the material uh, during the fusion bonding? I think just like uh, traditional welding, there's a lot of things we still don't understand. I think, uh, but in the research community, I think uh, there's a lot of things we can do in that direction. We, but basically, we like to see nowadays, they talk about big data. You know, big data basically means you're trying to understand the process more quantitatively. So eventually, you can put hand on the process, eventually you can get, let me say, the more optimized, uh, we call the processing window in terms of the parameter, then probably we can uh, produce the optimized uh, structure with the uh, optimal property. So that's the direction. So we need the data, we need the quantitative data for the process, basically. <laughs> so then once you have it, you can have a chance to to, 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 to control it. I think a lot of people working in this area talk about, uh, not the, in this area, like a lot of people talk about big data, machine learning, but basically hinting the direction is really trying to control the process more concisely. All I right, hope. so I have, uh, <laughs> I have another question actually. Okay, <laughs> thank you. All right, so from uh, Nor Hayani Os Osman, Thank you for sharing, Prof. Do you think by controlling the humidity during the process might reduce the void? Yes. So in fact, I didn't mention. Uh, I think uh, we did start with the uh, nylon absorbed water. 
they had the capability to absorb like 60% or 6%, not six, but a few percent of water. So it's a very delicate material. So I didn't mention, in fact, what we did is really we dry the material before we put on the machine. Even we don't do that, you'll have more, even more voids. So basically you need control. All right. Okay. Um, all right, so I have another questions here. Um, it is a very interesting research. Question one, what will be happen uh, when the fiber volume fracture is increased regarding high plasticity behavior can be seen in your result? So that's question one. And this question two, is the possibility to use more additive to this printing method? Yeah, I think both as uh, I think, uh, let's say, first thing is really, we really like to increase the volume fraction. That's uh, basically for the composite, I think in particular for the aerospace composite, we really talk about the volume fraction like 60 or 70 percent, because that's basically maximize the potential of the fiber reinforced composite. So, uh, but uh, how to increase it, that's something we are also exploring, it's really how to increase the volume fraction fiber. It's not that uh, easy from what we tried. Just like make a, a tape or the prepacked tape. Uh, there is a way to do it, but uh, the plasticity behavior probably will be less once you have a fiber. There has been a lot of discussion over the year about the toughened composite. People have been talking about using toughened matrix, like use uh, rubber or the other type of the liquid uh, polymer to like soft polymer to top matrix. But once you have a lot of fiber inside, uh, then we say there is a constraint effect on the from the fiber on the plasticity. So eventually the fracture toughness is uh, uh, not uh, as uh, uh, we expected like a linear correlation or the linear projection, we don't get that. But uh, uh, at the moment we haven't really reached to that point, we still uh, trying to minimize the voids. Then once uh, the qu first question probably more relevant to a, a well-established composite. Yeah, that means uh, uh, people like thermoplast composite, uh, like carbon fiber reinforced, uh, uh, probably the, the ketone or the, or, or the PEI or the nylon. They, I think once you have a fiber, definitely you don't see a, a linear correlation between the fractured toughness of, of the polymer and the fractured toughness of the composite. This is a, a different topic. Second thing is that we say to use more additive to this printing method. Yeah, I think uh, that pe people have been talking about a multiple, multiple printing head. You can really print, a, have a diverse uh, thing, but that is a, it's a lot of uh, opportunity here. So you can try a lot of different idea to uh, make it more versatile or in terms of functional functionality, yeah. Uh, my background, because a mechanical engineer, normally we just focus on the on the mechanical property or the stiffness, strength, the fracture toughness, the creep fatigue, not uh, into like functionality area. But I'm sure this technology can be applied to the different method. But you have to make sure those phase are missable. That's it's a really talking about the polymer, they not, some of them have different uh, surface energy. They don't just don't uh, stick to each other. <laughs> so here you have to uh, be careful to make sure those polymer are really miscible. That's when they can have an uh, intermolecular diffusion eventually for fields together. All right, so um, can I ask one more question? Yeah, sure. Okay. Before, before we wrap up. Um, so this is a question from Dr. Ami Frida, um, your okay. former okay. student as well. Yeah. All right. So uh -huh. questions: Where do we? Where do you see the application here? Say in five years in biomedical. Okay, that's a good question. So, uh, thank you, Amy, for your question. I think uh, just say uh, uh, Amy also a PhD student. He. Uh, she stayed, spent a couple of years here, now she's back to Malaysia, I think. Okay, about application. I think uh, that's published, first area for application can be biomed. Yeah, that's for sure, yeah, because uh, the, the, the working condition are not really as critical as uh, 
the thing we talk about for the airplane, for car, or for other component. But uh, in that area, I think uh, the material currently produced and may be good enough. Yeah, in terms of strength and stiffness, probably not an issue. But the, then the porosity, porosity may may think some kind is useful. Like uh, if you, uh, you have an in vivo, in vivo trial, then bone can grow into inside or whatever. That means it can measure like uh, some biocompatibility with the uh, with the bone or the with the uh, tissue. But that's a different topic. I think uh, uh, before you put into the human body of this kind of material, probably need some kind of thorough study in terms of uh, biocompatibility, biosafety. Or this sort of thing. I think uh, definitely this is a, a direction I like to uh, work in, to work with the people in the area because my area is not in the biomed. I have to say, but uh, now they basically we learn from others. That's probably the direction we can go. Thank you, Amy. All right. <laughs> okay. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Prof. Yeah? Um, it's very interesting. Thanks for um, accepting our invitation. Oh, um, but <laughs> maybe we can do it again sometimes. Okay. Yeah. So I think, uh, <laughs> All right. You know, nowadays, this is a quite a, a popular. This kind of online lecture is really trying to meet people, trying to inspire the people. I think uh, this pandemic, pandemic. We hope it uh, will be gone very soon. Yeah, but. Uh, still hang around. I think uh, this kind of lecture may inspire the people see, okay, it's still some research is going on, okay. So what yeah, I can say, yeah. the academic, you know, we should keep the dream going. Yes. <laughs> Thanks for um, such a, a very informative talk. Uh, I'll pass to um, Professor Rafik for the concluding remark. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Habibah, uh, for moderating the session and for introducing Professor Linye to me. Uh, and to our distinguished speaker today, Professor Linye, thank you so very much for a great okay. Just to let you know that uh, my field of interest is in biomedical engineering, okay. and I am also involved in the development of composites for implant, internal implants okay. for orthopedic use. So uh, yes, uh, the reason why we use composite is mainly because of its lightweight. So uh, there is no need to use metals uh, if we can use composite. So uh, yeah. yes, hopefully we can uh, collaborate in the future yeah, related sure. yeah. to the use of biomedical composites. And uh, and one interesting fact, uh, Professor Linye, I've never been to Australia. So thank you very much for sharing uh, a bit about your country, a bit about Australia. Uh, so uh, hopefully one day after this COVID-19 pandemic, I'll be there and meet you. Okay, face yeah, to face. Yeah, I like to say, yeah, most welcome. I think now we know each other. I think after this uh, pandemic is gone, you are most welcome to visit uh, our school or the, our faculty. You can give a lecture here, talk about your study, then we can explore the collaboration. Yeah, good depths. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so very much, Professor Linye. And to all of you watching this UTM Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series, thank you so much for watching. Do stay tuned because we have many more interesting lectures for you. Until next time, bye bye for now. Bye bye. Okay, thank you. Okay, bye. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, thank you.